Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this lecture. Those that have arrived to hear the map and the diagram, I do apologize. Um, the two lectures, the two last lectures, have been transposed. And what, what I am tackling this week is the dissecting table. I'm not quite sure what I meant by the dissecting table when I proposed it first. <clears throat> I think what I meant was a place in which we might raise the world and examine it, a place above the support. I think I was thinking about the image as rising above the support to be examined, not in the view, not in the frame, but above the picture support itself. Indeed, that is part of what I meant. When you propose a topic, sometimes it takes over and it creates its own momentum. And I suddenly realized that there was more to the dissecting table than I first proposed. It is a place of examination. But what I shall try and show is that this examination actually goes more than the object. That actually we shall move this examination from the object back through to the subject itself, to the observer. I'd just like to add a few things before starting, and that is, in these talks, I seem to be getting muddled. I seem to be getting muddled between vision, the imagination, seeing, the gaze. But somehow, that is exactly where I should be muddled. The imbrication of those different terms is exactly what I'm about. Although I'm exa examining vision, it has implications for the imagination. And these implications for the imagination is exactly what we need to tease out. The topic this week is, of course, vision. We shall try and attach it to the imagination. The dissecting table. I wish to make my first dissection. This dissection is Paul Valeri's. Paul Valeri talks of three bodies and a fourth that haunts his project. This I wish to lay as its sort of template against which I can gauge the rest of the talk. The first body he proposes is my body. That's not literally my body, but in the general, my body that we inhabit. I quote fragments from a beautiful, elliptical, well-crafted, um, piece of work, piece of writing, I realize that in these quotes and in this dissection, I'm actually creating a mutilation. I am creating a dismembered body. But if you'll bear with me, there's things within this that can point to what comes next. Valeri says, my body is a privileged, privileged object of which at, any, at each instance, sorry, we find ourselves in possession, although our knowledge of it like everything that is inseparable from the instant, may be extremely variable and subject to illusions. This my body obeys or disobeys, favors or obstructs our designs. It engenders surprising strengths and weaknesses connected wholly or in part with its perceptible mass, which at times takes on a sudden charge of impulsive energies that make it act in response to some interior mystery and at other times seems to become almost crushing and an immovable weight. This is this empty shell that we inhabit, this thing that we know only by the instant of our actions. The second body is the one which others see, and in an approximation of which confronts us in the mirror or portraits. This body goes little further than, the, than a view or a surface. One can live without ever having seen oneself, without knowing the color of one's skin. That is the fate of the blind. It is worthy of note that the living, thinking, acting man is without knowledge of his inner organization. All his faculties of action are turned to the outside world, so much so that this outside world might be defined as what can be affected by our means of action. This body is the socialized body. This is the body constituted in the gaze of the other, as we talked about in the first week. 
There is a third body. It has unity only in our thought, since we know it for having dissected and dismembered it. To know it is to have reduced it to parts and pieces. It gives off scarlet or whitish liquids or hyalins, some of them quite viscous. We remove elements of varying sizes, fashioned so to fit exactly in place. Sponges, vessels, tubes, fibers, articulated rods, reduced thin slices or tiny drops. Our specimens reveal under the microscope corpuscular shapes that resemble nothing at all. We try to decipher these histological cryptograms. This is the body perhaps of science. This is the body examined as an object. The fourth body, Valeri says, may equally be called the real or imaginary bo body. This body haunts the other three bodies. It is the coherent matrix in which the others work. It is the deep structure by which we know the other bodies. In terms of the first talk, this might be that matrix we talked about that Rosalind Krauss suggested, the one that pulses, the one where things transform. Valeri says, it is indivisible from the unknown and unknowable. It is, uh, sorry, it is indivisible from the unknown and unknowable medium intimated by the scientists when they torture the perceptible world. And proceeding by the indirect means of relays within, disclose phenomena whose origin they situate far below or above the scope of our senses. Above and beyond the scope of our imagination and ultimately of intellection itself. This body is not one of the other three bodies. Moreover, the mind's knowledge is a product of what this fourth body is not. Necessarily and irrevocably, everything that it is masks for us something that might be. What I wish to do is to raise one of these bodies. This is the next cut. The body I propose to address initially is the third body. This body is ripe for vivisection. Indeed, it is described by Valeri in these terms. It is the body of dissection. The body raised is not a Lazarus, but a dead and sculptoric body. It is the body of the Renaissance. My analysis of race, Renaissance space last week was less than complete. We had a safe, we had a window in the tectonic space, but we didn't have anything to put into it. And this week we start with that examination, that examination above the plane of the picture. Is that all right at the back, with the lights on? Can you see? This is a drawing by Albrecht Dürer. And we can see that the geometricalized space of the Renaissance is taken to the object examined. We examine it by a series of arcs and curves. This examination is taken on the plane of the picture. It does not inhabit the body. This becomes a tenor that lies over the body. I put up this drawing and I can't remember who did it. What's going on with that? There we are, Rubens did it, it's on there. Um, the body here is examined, starts to have form, but it's examined as a series of cells, plates, that both work to describe individual features, muscles, but also begin to work to describe that cubic essence that Schopenhauer might talk about of the body, its extension, its substance, its materiality. Drawings by Albrecht Dürer, where that cubic essence is taken to the body. There's two movements here that will be described. This is an idealization of the body. The body is understood in terms of an ideal geometry. 
of ideal forms. This is understood in terms of the cube. We see the torso in the left-hand corner crated. This crating and understanding of the world is something we take forward. This is still in Habit's architectural practice. This somehow precedes and uh, intimates the um, orthographic projections of, Fran of, of Francis Mong and the later work of Farish when they use isometric projections. It's, it's an analysis and an attempt to build. It is a tectonic art. We can see in Luca Cambiasso's drawing the allegory of the artist, the pen and wash emphasizes the cubic construction of the figure. What happens to this geometricalized body is that it is used not only as analysis, well all analysis is used to actually control. In Albrecht Dürer's examination of the facial features, he is starting to categorize types and personalities. This categorization of these types and personalities against ideal forms starts to move into the political sphere. We start to make um, decisions about the way things should be, the way things should look. I put these in because this, the cubic nature of the body still inhabits the world we draw in today. Here we have drawings from a book by Bridgman in which he analyzes three fundamental forms within the human body. It is amazing that within art rooms the simple um, suggestion that the body is composed of essential and fundamental forms, the thorax, the pelvis and the head being the major ones through the trunk of the body is enough to start to give the student substance and form within their work. Here we have some more Bridgman's. And again, you can see the crating of the body and an analysis through the crating. The reason why the crate is used within the Renaissance is it carries coordinates by which we can measure. The right angle and the vertical are coordinates by which we can measure the three-dimensionality and place the features of the figure and the volume of the figure. We mentioned last week that there were two forms within the Renaissance. There was the tectonic, well there were three, we could describe the Baroque, but there was the descriptive and the constructive, the tectonic. These are drawings by Michelangelo. Here we have peeled back the skin from the body and examined it as a descriptive art. The tendons are drawn very much in the act of describing. They are not in the act of building. This informs his work. He works from the inside out. The inside is a description. We look at the musculature. The outside moving in becomes an ide idealization of the form. We will have a look at this in a second. We can see here Michelangelo uses the idealized form. Here it is not pure tendon, but we use the ovoid, that fundamental building block to build our body. This ovoid is taken and examined above the support. We will see that all these images rise above the support. They are not placed back into the view. But each of the ovoids is separated from the body, examined and lit and top lit. The light that inhabits this picture is not the light of a directional, of, of a directional light that works within the view. This is the light of examination. Each volume is top lit. So each <coughs> ovoid, as you can see, each ovoid has its own light source. 
This toplet ovoid is then placed back into the body. The contours of the body, uh, a lot of students beginning to draw have problems with this notion of um, construction, of the tectonic art of, um, of drawing. They start to describe surface instead of what causes the thing at the surface to happen. In Michelangelo, this is clear. He understands the ovoid as the thing that pushes up at the skein, at the surface of the skin drawn tight across it. Peter Paul Rubens' drawings are almost an ecstasy of examination. They both strip bare the skin, but also make a sculptoric reference. They both work from inside and from outside. It is about sculpture and it is about description at the same time. This is an abundance of muscle. We can see that within the Renaissance, not only is there strict examination, but there's also a florid um, flaunting of that examination and a reconstruction of the figure whereby these, some, most of these muscles make very little or no sense. This is a drawing by Michelangelo, and what is interesting here is what the mark de denotes. Um, I'm, uh, I have trouble moving towards the picture, but if you can see on the right leg, that little movement, the occlusion that comes into the figure, um, the occlusion means an overlapping line. It breaks into the figure, describes the back, the hollow, the volume created by the hamstring. Without that mark there, that leg flattens. And the whole um, nature of that drawing is composed as a series of convexities. And these convexities break at times into the figure to create um, uh, planes and overlap and describe the volumes. This is a drawing by Albrecht Dürer. In this drawing, as you can see, I've drawn over it actually in parts. There's a series of ovoids, again you can see pushing up the skin. This is further emphasized by the, gra uh, the grapheme, this mark that wraps round the surface of the picture. It follows the surface contour. But most of these descriptions, most of these analogies are placed on the page and are related in a homologous way to other constructions, to other features of nature. Leonardo da Vinci's description of the female anatomy is compared to the male anatomy. It is understood at this point as a mechanism and it attaches itself to other mechanisms within the world. Here we can see that actually the spinal column is understood as a simple mechanism. At the beginning of the 17th and 18th century a command or an imperative of the life room was know thyself. All life room activity started with the words know thyself. What this did is was, um, did not introduce the first body into um, consideration. It actually moves towards the second body, the socialized body. It carries an ethical and moral dimension, this know thyself. The life room was a punishment. It was a punishment beyond death. It was the criminal, usually the criminal was the corpse um, that was uh, examined. And this criminal was set up as exemplar. You should not transgress. So although we're examining the third body, the second body also inhabits um, our consideration, this socialized dimension to the body. 
I want to move on quickly to the 17th and 18th century and present uh, an argument by Carey. Oh, sorry, before doing that, um, this drawing, The Sense of Beauty by Hogarth, shows how the geometricalized body is a sense of control. The notion of beauty was something moral. It was a moral imperative that worked through the Renaissance right up into the 17th and 18th centuries. One should have the notion within the observing subject of a geometry of beauty. This also was a moral that should inhabit the subject of observation. Hogarth sends this very notion up in this beautiful etching where we're examining classical features. You can see in the bottom hand side he sends up the notion, this is almost like a, um, uh, windows on a, uh, on a, um, uh, a screen, on a, a computer screen by which you can choose and select and build your, your, your notions of beauty. I wish to move on to something that Jonathan Crary proposes, and I advise all of you to read what is a beautiful um, description of the modernizing of vision. He describes this in both vision and visuality and techniques of the observer. In this, he chronicles a model of vision for the 17th and 18th century based on the paradigm of the camera obscura. Crary draws distinction between the operation of the camera obscura and the understanding of it as a social artifact, as a thing for epistemological consideration. He does suggest that the do dominant paradigm of vision in the, uh, the 18th and 19th century is the camera obscura. And certainly the writing that abounds on the camera obscura uh, would mean that we wouldn't find it difficult to um, affirm his ideas. Although around for 2,000 years, the camera obscura came into its own in the 17th and 18th century. Um, Descartes describes the camera obscura in Lydioptric. He describes it as a chamber with a single hole with glass, with a glass lens. A white sheet stretched at certain distance, a certain distance where one could um, display images on the, screen, on, on the screen. He goes on to advise his reader to use the eye of a dead person or ox in the hole. Cut away the three surrounding membranes at the back so as to expose a large part of the humor, he says, without spilling any. No light must enter the room except what comes through the eye, all of whose parts you know to be entirely transparent. Having done this, if you look at the white sheet, you will see there, not perhaps without pleasure, and wonder, and wonder, a picture representing in natural perspective all the objects outside. It's an early 18th century drawing where there's a comparison between the eye and the camera obscura. I revisit this painting by Vermeer which shows very much the idea of the camera obscura in terms of how it might be constructed as a paradigm of thought. Here we have the geographer. The window no longer shows an exterior space, as we said last week. It is pure light. And inside this interior, the geographer examines evidence of that external world. It has no reference, nor is he constituted in the exterior world. This is Locke's conception of our um, thinking. That what happens is we image something and we sit in attendance on this image. We examine within our interior space the world. This is very much what is portrayed in Vermeer's picture. What we ignore 
In this instance, sorry, I didn't mean to go into that, but we will go on to that anyway. What we ignore in that instance is the um, notion of the socialized observer, the outside world, the second body. My second dissection starts here. This dissection is a break between the notion of the objective vision that carried through from the Renaissance through to the 17th and 18th century and notions of an effective vision, a subjective vision. Goethe starts with the camera obscura. He describes it and then suggests that we might close the hole. He there, thus, in the single gesture, blurs the distinction between the inner and outer space. He says, the hole being closed, let him look towards the darkest part of the room. A circular image will now be seen to float before him. The middle of the circle will appear bright, colorless, or somewhat yellow, but the border will appear red. After a time, this red increasingly this red increasing towards the center covers the whole circle and at last the bright central point and at last the bright central point no sooner however is the whole circle red than the edge begins to be blue and the blue gradually encroaches inwards on the red when the hole is blue the edge becomes dark and colorless the dark edge again slowly encroaches on the blue till the whole circle appears colorless What is suddenly found out that vision is not constructed as something that does not have, inhabit the first body. In that single gesture, we bring the first body into the picture. We actually have combined the third body and the first body. Vision is now something subjective. When we close our eyes, there is something that goes on in our head beyond the external world. I put this on, I don't know if you wish to do a test on, on it, but uh, if I flip that, I don't know how we do this, if you look at that and I flip that off, anyone get an after image? I'll try it again. Look through the eye, through a little um, eyepiece in your hands and I'll flip it off. any colors? Anyone seeing anything? No, it probably needs some light. We'll move on. Blue, bluey green, good. The after image starts to be the thing that haunts the early part of the um, 19th century. This is by Perkin Jay and is a series of drawings of the after image. This after image and other experiments on subjective vision um, as in simultaneous contrast and other things starts to give the observer a new perceptual autonomy. It also coincided with the making of this observer into a subject of new knowledge. This um, subject of new knowledge was also a place to practice new techniques of power. The terrain on which these two interrelated observers emerged in the 19th century became the science of physiology. There was an excitement and wonderment about the body which now appeared like a new continent to be explored. It was a new continent to be mapped and mastered with new recesses and mechanisms now uncovered for the first time. But the real importance of physiology has less to do with any empirical discoveries than that it becomes the arena for new types of epistemological reflection that depend on knowledge about the eye and processes of vision. It signals how the body was becoming the site of both power and truth. The sun became a preoccupation of scientists and artists. Indeed, three of the scientists of the age went blind um, by uh, 
exploring the visionary capacities of the sun. Let me just see who they were. Fechner was definitely one of them. I don't know who the others were. I'll return to it later. Um, Turner very much influenced by the discoveries going on, by the kind of way the sun imprints itself on the eye. It creates um, effects beyond the objective vision. The sun becomes central to Turner's vision. It becomes the moment of truth within his picture, a scientific discovery at the heart of his pictures. But this notion of the subjective vision has its problems. It is constituted outside the world. It gave rise to new kinds of thinking. It gave rise to romanticism, new visionary thoughts. Although it is the start of modernism, it also declares some of the problems of modernism. It declares the notion of the observer as a kind of productive subject, not responsible in the world for the actions away from them. It is Merleau-Ponty later in the 20th century that starts to try to connect, as we have in this, the viewer back into the picture of the world, back into the substance of the world. We have all sorts of stimulus and experiments going on in the 18th and 19th century with the observer they're finding out that the electrical impulse which would um, stimulate one of the nerve endings for vision would create a different response, that we could have the same stimulus that would create a different response in different senses. We also have discoveries that the single nerve cell of vision or of any other thing could be stimulated in s similar ways by different stimuli and get the same result. We have the separation of the centers. Main de Biron related all these senses, these different senses, these separated senses, uh, senses to a particular controlling vital sense. This he calls the kinesthetic sense. It is an awareness of the body in perception. It is that, like our fourth body, to which the other senses cohere. Anyway, returning to Merleau-Ponty, who I deviated from. Merleau-Ponty writes, vision happens in the world as one of its facts. We do not simply see the world, it also shows itself to us. We are in these terms the place through which the world comes to visibility. And our seeing of it is therefore not simply our own. Vision is a chiasmus in the world, a sight of its interlacing in and through itself. This chiasmus cannot be articulated in pu purely visual terms. We are the place the world sees or shows itself because we are of the world. Here, Merleau-Ponty is trying to tackle the problem of the notion that subjective vision cauterizes or dissects itself from the exterior world returns to the same problem of the Renaissance. What needs then to be thought is the way in which our belonging to the world is manifested as our visual separation from it, our having it as objects within a horizon from which we are significantly but not absolutely distant. Vision is the place where our continuity with the world conceals itself, the place where we mistake contact for, dis for distance, imagining that seeing is a substitute for rather than a mode of touching. And it is this anesthesia, this senselessness at the heart of transparency that demands our acknowledgement and pushes our dealing with the visual beyond recognition. A substitute for rather than a mode of touching. This is what I'd like to take on through the rest of the talk. This haunted thought about vision through the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. 
The problem was constructed by Molyneux. The idea that a blind man can feel objects like a cone and cylinder. Let's imagine him in the room, feeling a cone and a cylinder. He suddenly is able to see. When he sees, does he see them as he envisioned them? Does the sense of touch, does this other sense inform vision? This is an, an illustration by um, Max Ernst, which for me illustrates the notion of um, Merleau-Ponty. Us being outside the frame of the picture looking in, but also constituted as the girl within it. We look both within the zoetrope, which is also a feature of 18th and 19th century, uh, sorry, 17th and 18th century, uh, 18th and 19th century thought. And, uh, and outside it. So we, we are doubly constituted within the picture. This is his notion of both being in the world and distanced from it by sight. Both being in the place of touching and in the place of viewing. What I wish to re review in this is the sense, this is my next cut, is the sense of touch. Before that, I'd like to just say a few things about vision. Um, although we look, at the, the latest trends are to look at vision as a socially and cu culturally constructed artifact or cult cultured, uh, constructed thing, I think that there is a basic, fundamental, perceptual activity. This is not one perceptual activity. We work within a complexity of vision and of perception. And it is in this complexity that we make choices about the way we make pictures and make choices about the way we see the world. Although we can construct Renaissance images within a particular frame of, of visioning or of, of seeing, a thought occurs to me. Would a Renaissance child draw the same, in the same way, as a child in the 1990s? There must be some basic notions about perception that need to be tackled. Perspective clearly is not the full picture. It is one of the possibilities that lurks within vision. I use Giacometti as an example of a particular notion about vision. Vision is ambulatory. We walk through the world. We inhabit our world. And it is ambient. We have the notion beyond the attention of the world as well, but beyond our directed intention, of a peripheral vision, of a thing going on outside the scope of our seeing. This is, the full picture of the world is never constituted on the retina. The optic nerve comes through the retina and there's huge gaps in our seeing. What I want to propose at this point is that the gaze is a fiction. That the still image that we have of the camera obscura is a fiction and that what the world is constituted by is a series of glimpses and glances within the picture. This is certainly what happens within Giacometti's drawing. Giacometti's drawing is about measurement, but it is also about fragments. It has duration. Drawing is built up as a series of glimpses, a series of movements across the picture plane to locate and measure. It is a drawing on the reticule, if you like, but it is inhabited by the glance, by the glimpse. It has the saccadic eye movement. This is a movement of the eye that is directed by the peripheral vision towards something that it wants to see. It's goal directive and it's also selective. It then focuses attention on particular features of the world. This occurs within our foveal vision. That we have this direction towards intention. And within this picture, 
That foveal vision is almost symbolized, well, is symbolized in the way the head, the intensity of the head is constructed. The lines and the movements around that drawing are all directed in towards that head. There's a series of features within that. Although it is still about perspective, perspective itself is inhabited by the glance and the look. And what we have here is a drawing infused by seeing. The drawing also has the touch, that particular notion that Merleau-Ponty talked about. It is a touch at the surface of the picture as a form of looking. It's another drawing by Giacometti, which also has a sense of the haptic within it. This is a sense of feeling, a sense of exploring the, 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 uh, um, the figure through touch. This figure is not constituted in space, but rises to the surface and is here felt and explored by a series of actions of the hand. The actions of the hand relate to touching, in this instance, not to seeing. The first picture was about seeing, although within that you can see there are construction lines which are more to do with seeing. This is drawn by Frank Auerbach, and here we can see duration becomes a part of the drawing. The idea that we look through a period, that we look through time, that we look and each line carries a moment, a trajectory of looking, which is erased, and the former looks are created as palimpsests under the surface of those looks. Each look is gathered into the final drawing into the gaze. There's a series of erasures, a series of obliterations of looks until we come up to the image. So another Giacometti, and here the looking happens again within the body. It is, has relationship to the Renaissance body, but here the looking inhabits the figure. I want to direct the, the rest of this talk, as indeed I, I might have been intimated in the way I've been talking about the slides, to the notion of touch, to the texture of, of the drawing and the, the notion of action on a page. This is a drawing by Seurat. And what happens is that the whole surface of the retina is constituted here within the drawing. We look through... Um, a texture, we look through a screen, we look through a touching at the retina at the image. It's almost like a mosquito screen is supplied before we see. Although this is a representation perhaps of what happens on the retina, this corpuscular surface is a thing that lies above the image. The surface itself becomes a place of touching. drawing by Rembrandt, and a series when we confront the landscape, we are, in fact, having to make an inventory of touching to stand for particular features of the landscape. We need to make a squiggle for foliage. That squiggle in vision is a sense of how we might touch foliage. So texture is here a series, it is in, it is sort of catalogued and becomes an inventory which we apply within the features of the world as denotative features. Here within Van Gogh, it both the touch or the stab of the mark is both a feature of the world but a feature of the subject who is exploring that world. So it has a connotative meaning. It also becomes part of his expression. Steinberg. Within every drawing mark, there's a sense of the autographic. There is a sense of the subject. I mentioned it within the Van Gogh drawing, but it is certainly true here in the Steinberg drawing. The marks carry a signature of the artist. And we can use these marks as a stimulus for the imagination. This is a drawing by Susan Hiller. What she has done 
is she has a support or a background that is a Masters of War um, wallpaper, boy's own stuff. And what she does her, is um, do a drawing which is a series of automatic habits, her unconscious scanning that she thinks is the world she, she uses as a female essence. This unconscious scanning is constituted as a female essence which contrasts against the masters of war picture. This lays as a mask against the boy's own background. It masks out the male stuff and we can see through the negative shapes of the mark which are the female essence, the picture. This is a drawing of Miro, or sorry, photographs of Miro at work in the studio. There's two photographs, if you're wondering. Um, and here the mark becomes a generating axis for thought. It is laid down. The action of the body, the somatic thought, starts to inhabit pictorial practice and thought. This somatic thought is what I'd like to bring through the whole talk. The early drawings of Picasso. This is Guernica. We can see that Guernica is at this point a series of rhythms, no more. It's just a series of gestures, a pulse on the page. The action of the hand constitutes that sort of pulsing that Rosalind Krauss was talking about and I mentioned in the first lecture. This is a drawing by Twombly where the mark and the writing and the action, this notion of touching, becomes a pre-language. It becomes a pre-thought. It is an act of dirtying. It's before the thought. It is that jumble through which we are trying to constitute the thought. The Chinese and Japanese calligraphy, the mark or the action is constituted in two ways, made in two ways. One, it is socially and culturally ordained. It lies within cultural practice. One learns one calligraphic mark. But it also has space for the particular artists to express themselves. This is a drawing by Bruce Nauman. These are ostensibly plans for projects, but they're not quite right. Things are broken. They, lines just fracture beyond the point of intersection. They just go beyond. There's pentimenti, there's ghosts, there's mistakes that inhabit the drawing. These projects are constituted against aesthetic noise. The pentimenti work to provoke against the kind of precision of the project. This is a drawing by Robert Morris. It's called Blind Time. And what happens is the subject, the actual action that he, that he took, blindfolding himself to make the drawing, starts to come through into the drawing. This is an extreme situation in which he draws and communicates. He takes away vision to create something of vision. And without the sight, what he tries to, 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 to build up is a picture of an apocalyptic vision, a place without sight, a sight without sight. This is a blackout curtain. It is revealed as marks and as substance but it obscures anything that lies underneath it. This is a drawing by Richard Diebenkorn. And here we can see that the drawing is a series of decisions. There's rubbings out, there's redrawings, there's um, movements across the page. The movement is not the movement of the model, but the movement of decisions about composition on the page the artist's thinking. 
These are not removed from the drawing, but are very much carried through. This is a work by Pannoni. And this sense of touch, that point at which we contact the world, this thing of touching is exactly what he confronts here. This is the interface, this is skin drawn up close. It's the microscopic um, vision of that moment where we interface with the world. There are two touches in here. One is in the illusion of skin, which touches, and the other is in the production. This becomes a series of stabs and fractures and, and, and movements to, to create this other touching, which is the touching of the image. There is, this is a drawing by Arnulf Reiner. And here he attacks the image of the photograph in an extreme body language, an extreme histrionic gesture. And by this action, he attempts to restore the potency of the image. The face flinches at the contact, at the attack of the surface. And this creates a relationship of presences. The artist as someone that acts, and the artist as an image in the picture. These are drawings by even Ian McKeever. And here he thinks of drawing like a landscape that both reveals and conceals. It reveals its own actions but conceals anything that's underneath it. And here he creates a contest between the drawing and the photograph. Between the action and the notion of some kind of imprint or for reality. Basilets. The series of marks that obliterate, that hide, are exactly what constitutes the face. He talks here of these hidden figures, this hidden black history, but it, have, it, it is in the mark that this black history is also obscured, but that obscuring is also an act of revealing. There's a conundrum in here, a contradiction that carries through into the drawing. Arshal Gorky. The contrast of marks, the incisive scalpel-like mark that cuts into the surface, contrasted against the smudging and dirting of the page. There's an elusive quality to this drawing. It is not elusive, it's not illusory, it's illusory. It starts to talk of things of which it is not. It is not quite human, it is not quite vegetal, it is not quite anatomical. And the marks themselves start to create a tension in this way. St. Elmo's Fire by Boyce. Here it is actually the material of drawing that becomes important. Oil itself. The oil, he uses oil and blood. This is a spiritual drawing. It's a drawing of transubstantiation. He acts as a shaman that presides over matter. He tries to transform this matter into image. These are intimations of things that you can't represent. St. Elmo's fire is the corolla around, the haze around the thing. It is not the thing in itself. And here he's drawing the invisible. He's drawing what is not the thing. This last drawing is by C P Peter Sabara again. And this drawing is done with coffee. And here the moment of his drawing, the particular notion that he is sitting there drinking coffee, starts to act into the drawing. What I've build, been building up is an argument here. And this is my next cut. An argument that carries through from the modern. I don't know where it goes. I don't know what the next stage is. But this act of touching, this idea that we bump into things, 
this idea that the world is made of substance and that we need to manage this substance is precisely what I want to take into the postmodern condition. I want to bring this up against the simulators, the perceptrons, the virtual environments, the, the resonance imaging. This is vision severed from touch. I'm not, I have nothing against it. I have emerged from the land of Lud eventually. But Gaston Bachelard proposes that the concept is the day of thinking and the image is the night of thinking. And I just think that things go bump in the night. I just think that what is not there in terms of thinking is resistance. What is not there in terms of thinking is material. What is not there is, is gravity. At these moments in the world where our substance meets other substance, how we recompose that is not to go back and visit the modernist vision but to find a new way in which the touch and the act start to have inhabit the space of, that is not composed, these images that are not composed of substance, of light and such like, that are images composed of pure information. And how we do that, I think, is the problem we need to take forward. What I see within particular practice is images that have none of the subject within them. I see this within design, art, and such like. We have run away from what might have been called the experimentations of modernism, where we looked into our perceptions, that we confronted um, other ideas of space beyond perspective, where we looked at substance as an act of thinking. And I think somehow we need to bring that forward and re-examine that in the light of the postmodern. And that's my last cut. Thank you.